Happy Sabbath, everyone. Sabbath. Welcome to another uh, Divine Hour program here at Hillsboro Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is so good to see all of your smiling faces, and, um, and we have a pretty full house here today, so that is always a blessing. Um, so today, we are thankful that we have Pastor Will Ustazen here with us. He's going to be sharing the main message, and uh, that message is entitled, Who Owns Your Heart? And uh, I think that's an important question, so I'm looking forward to that. We're also definitely looking forward to the special music today, uh, which is going to be shared by uh, Heather Musgrave and Sydney. Sorry, thank you, and uh, and Whitney Andrew. Um, make sure I get it right. Uh, but this is kind of an encouragement for those of you guys who want to hear all of the special musics. Go ahead and join us right here. We have some more seats. I did say it was a full house, but we do have more seats. And uh, see, the situation is that we can't always play the backing tracks because that blocks our streaming. Um, and so anytime there is professional music that's a backing track, it blocks the whole entire video. So we can't do that. So if you want to hear that, uh, you do have a little bit of time. Go ahead and come on in, and it'll be right at the end of the service. So anyways, but we're looking for that forward to that, and, um, and so that's going to be very good. Let's just go ahead and pray as we open the service. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for your many blessings for bringing us through this week and uh, that we can have this Sabbath here together. We pray for your, <clears throat> we pray for your Holy Spirit to join us here again, and, uh, and we just thank you for your many blessings, and uh, that you bless every aspect of the message, that you bless the speaker as he is uh, bringing, um, as he is bringing the message here to us today. Thank you, Lord. For all of your gifts and blessings to us. Amen. Today's scripture reading comes from Proverbs 23, 12, and 26. Apply your heart to instruction and your words to knowledge, and your ears to words of knowledge. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. Thank you. I appreciate that. Welcome, Isaac, and welcome, everyone. It is good to see you all. It's kind of a rainy day here. Well, we don't see rain yet, but it's in the forecast. And it's always good when you have, when you have rain on a Sabbath because it reminds me of God's blessings. I don't know about you. Rain always uh, can be the symbol of blessing. So I'm so glad that you all made the choice and decided to come and worship with us here at Hillsboro today. When you look around you, you can see the changing of the seasons. You know, you can see that some of the trees are beginning to gradually shed their leaves. And um, so we're getting into the season and cooler days are coming, which is nice. The days will get shorter. The evenings will start sooner. And um, I don't know about you, but I don't mind, you know, winter. It's nice to have those long nights and you can just sit with your fireplace and have the atmosphere and especially Christmas time. I know we're still some way from Christmas, but I like that smell of apple cinnamon. That's my favorite, favorite fragrance. So uh, it's good to have you with us. And the audience joining uh, us from overseas, I know we have people from South Africa uh, joining us and also from England. So uh, just when it comes to my daughter and some of the friends from England joining us, I just want to pause for a moment and also just express our uh, heartfelt sadness at the loss of a wonderful lady in the person of Queen Elizabeth II. She was a matriarch, and uh, I know with her death, we've come to the end of an era. And I would just like to, on behalf of our Hillsborough Church, 
I would like to express our sincere condolences and heartfelt thoughts uh, with all of you, the royal family, uh, King Charles III, and also the people of the great country of Great Britain and Ireland and Scotland and the British Isles and the Commonwealth. We are going to get into the Word of God, so let's invite the Holy Spirit to come and open the Word to understanding. Father, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for this opportunity where we can invite your Holy Spirit to come into our midst. Lord, we open your Word with human hand. And we anticipate to hear the voice of God. Amen. Speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Where well, the Bible says in the scripture that Camille read for us this morning. Proverbs 23, 26. My son, and I may add the word son can really be translated as child. Because it doesn't mean the biological son. It really means my child. Give me your heart. Just that statement implies that our hearts can be somewhere else. Our hearts do not necessarily belong to God. That's why God says, give me your heart. It's a choice that God encourages us to take. The fact that God says, my son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways, tells me that there's also another owner that can lay claim to our hearts. That is the owner called sin. Why would God want us to give him our hearts? Can we trust God with our hearts? And I want to especially speak to our younger people today, the, our teens and young adults because you are living at the point, at the point in history, at the stage in this world's growth and development that has been unlike anything before. And it's a time when people don't always think seriously about religious issues. Why would God want our hearts? What can God do with us when we give him our heart? He says, let your eyes observe my way. So God is inviting us to observe something about him. Max Lucado, in his book, He Chose You, shares a very powerful explanation of the love of a parent for a baby. He writes and he says, consider the newly parents the parents that have just become parents of a newborn child. Consider this couple with a newborn child. That baby offers the parents absolutely nothing. There's no money. There's no skill. No words of wisdom. And even if the baby had pockets, those pockets would be empty because babies are not born with money in their pockets. To look at that infant in a bassinet is to look at utter helplessness. As that baby is just lying there crying and moving his little fingers around and trying to make sense with the world around him or her, there's really no value to that child, or is there? Well, what is there to love? Max Lucado asks. What is there to love in a newborn baby? He said, whatever it is, mom and dad will always find it. And here's why. Just look at mom's face as she cuddles her baby. Or just watch dad's eyes as he holds his child. Now here's the test. If you just dare to harm or speak evil of that little one, you're in trouble. That's when you are facing the force of love from the parents like you never knew existed. It's a very mighty force. Now, Jesus said something about the love of a parent for a child in Matthew 7. When Jesus compared it to prayer, 
In Matthew 7 and in verse 11, Jesus asked a question. He says, If you then, being evil, speaking about the human race, if you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, and may I add, if you, being evil, know how to express your love and to protect of love for your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So God says, if you think you had love for your child, God loves that child even more. Amen. Now don't forget, in God's eyes, you and I are still children. Which means God loves us with a passion. And it's only because of that love that God has for us that God appeals to us and says, My child, give me your heart. Give me your heart because you can trust me. You know why? Because I love you with a protective, unconditional love. As a matter of fact, we read in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Jeremiah 31, verse 3, where God says, The Lord has appeared of old to Jeremiah, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It's a love that doesn't have a beginning. It doesn't have an end. It's a love that will never run out. It's a love that will never change in degree. That's an everlasting love. Therefore, God says, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. But yet, there is an enemy that is also targeting the heart. And Jesus, in a very metaphorical way, explained this enemy in a conversation he had very early on in Scripture. Remember the conversation Jesus had with Cain? When Cain was breathing anger and hatred against his brother Abel? Remember the conversation that God had with Cain. Come with me to Genesis chapter 4, and we pick up the story there. So the Lord said to Cain, this is Genesis 4 verse 6, Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? Because Cain was targeting his brother. He was targeting a child of God, the one whom God loves with an everlasting love. And God is trying to bring Cain to his senses. Cain, he says, why are you considering these thoughts? Why are you allowing these thoughts to, to really pollute your heart? And then God said to him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Where? Where? At the door. Now think about this. When sin lies at the door, what does that mean? Why do we use doors? We use doors to walk through. A door can be an entrance, it can be an exit. God says sin is lying right there in the path that you have to walk. And notice what the Bible says the desire of sin is for you, but you should rule over it. This text tells me, young people, that there's a power out there outside of God's everlasting kindness and love that's also trying to kidnap your heart. This brings me to the context that we find ourselves in today. We live in a world today that's so unlike the world that I grew up in and my parents grew up in and even your parents grew up in. And the question can be asked, why is it important for us to have a clear, definite understanding of the world around us? Here's why, because we need to know what that door is where sin is lying with a passion, with an eagerness 
to grab us. If we can identify that door, we will know how we ought to walk through it, right? If we can know where that door is. Because of the dangers around us, we live in a world today, and I like the way that Dr. Jean Poulin, who is professor of New Testament at La Sierra University, in his book, Knowing God in a Real World, Jean Poulin points out the fact that the two basic dangers impact in society today, and there might be many more, but he's highlighting two. He says are primarily two things that we as God's people need to be acutely aware of because they pose the greatest danger to who owns the heart today. One is the secular society that we live in. A society where we live with technology, the internet, the social media, where many Christians are beginning to question not only the Bible, but the very existence of God. Tragically, as it might sound, there are Christians who are really deep in their inner minds, wondering, does God really exist? Is there really a God out there? Who says, I've not been told the wrong thing? Who says the Bible can be trusted? And because of that questioning that becomes subject to our human reasoning, oftentimes we open the door to technology and we, we assume that the internet and the social media will give us all the answers that we need to have. Many people today are growing insecure about their faith in God, even insecure about, about being called children of God. even Seventh-day Adventists. So the one thing that is creating a big issue for us is a secular society we live in. Now, what does it mean to have a secular society? The dominance of the secular culture means that human reasoning is beginning to replace the fundamentals of God's word. We try to subject truth. We try to subject the understanding of God and the principles of his word and even the values and the moral issues of the Bible, we begin to subject it to our own human reasoning. And we feed our human reasoning and the thought processes through our exposure to the internet and the social media. That becomes our source of information. Now when that happens, the problem is that we tend to begin to rely more on our five senses as the arbiters of truth. And we are beginning to marginalize the scripture and the word of God and the authority it has. Now when God is no longer at the center and God is pushed out and we begin to run our senses, guess who becomes the authority in your life? You become the authority. You become the God. Which makes me think of a conversation way back in a garden where a serpent once said to, the, to Eve at the, at the tree, God is intimidated by you. Just take this fruit and you shall be like God. Any attempt, any idea that I can be God and make my own decisions, and formulate my own truth and own understanding is a deception that comes from that ancient serpent. He hasn't changed at all. The supernatural is viewed with skepticism. We don't really believe in miracles unless it can be scientifically proved. Science has become the God of our culture. And God has no way to compete with that. It's interesting when you have conversations with people. And I'm saying this to our young people because you are going to schools and colleges where you are confronted with this in the classroom, in your friends, in the conversations you have, where people are throwing signs at you. Signs all the time. 
No wonder that even the Bible, Peter says, we live in a world where all knowledge is according to the signs falsely so-called. I always have a problem. When a scientist claims to have all the answers, but he totally rejects the creation story of God. That tells me that scientist has no biblical basis. With all due respect, our scientists out there. But to me, a scientist who rejects the very notion of a God who is the creator is standing on shaky ground. The second area, besides the secular culture that we have around us, is from the 1970s, we've all of a sudden become accustomed to the concept of a new age kind of thinking. What is New Age thinking? New Age thinking emphasizes an amorphous, feel-good spirituality. What it is, is it ties in with the secular culture in that man becomes the center. It's an existentialistic kind of approach to everything that is out there. And the biggest danger is that when I become the authority of my own value system, then there's no norm. I become the norm. God's word is no longer the norm upon which we can base our discussion and our reasoning because I become the authority. It's like Rene Descartes once said, I reason and because I can reason, I can find truth for myself. There's nothing new. This has been age old because it's part of the outflow of the devil's tactics. What's the result? The result is that new age thinking that places man at the center of his own theological system means that when you get to the point where you've done something wrong, when you feel your guilt, when you sense a feeling of guilt and you feel you haven't, you haven't done what you should have done, or as Paul says in Romans 7, the good which you want to do, I don't do, the evil I don't want to do, that I do, that's my dilemma, The problem is with new age thinking, when you get to the point where you have guilt because you know you've done something wrong, you can do either one of two things. You can either confess, repent, tell God about it and accept his forgiveness, or you can change your theology. That's the other side of the coin. I fear that today, most people are changing their theology about it. We want to really legitimize sin. We want to move away from the morals of God's word, and we want to place a positive spin on the evils in the world. Jean Poulin points out the fact that he says, and because of this influence, because of secular society on the one hand, a new age thinking that places man in the middle of his own evaluation of truth and his own evaluation of values and morality. Because that happens, he says there's a secular drift that is taking place that's moving us further away from God. And this is what I want to appeal to you. To guard and to be always in your guard tower to look at what's happening. Because the devil's methods can be very subtle at times. No one wakes up one morning and decides that I'm going to give up on what I believed yesterday. It doesn't happen like that. Because there's a gradual process that starts over time. And there are a few pointers that tell us how this process happens. So here I want to appeal to you. Take note of these principles. Take note of these steps that the devil is very subtly allowing to come into your experience and my experience and leads us away, because here's why. We live in a world where God has placed you and me. There's a saying that says, life is God's gift to me. How I live my life is my gift to him. How should we live our lives? To be to God's glory. 
How should we live our lives when we come and say, Lord, you've asked me to give you my heart. I want you to own my heart. But the devil is trying to prevent that at all cost. And the first area where the secular drift begins is not in the world, it's not in the classroom, it's not at the university, it's not because of the friends we have around us. Oh no. We often blame friends. I know as parents, we often say, oh, you know, I don't know what went wrong with Johnny, because it's in Johnny became friends with such and such that his life is not what it used to be. Or since, since Elizabeth had been hanging out with this friend, her life is not what it used to be. We always look at the friends, but we forget there's a deeper issue. The area where the devil begins to make an inroad into my walk with Jesus is in my personal, private prayer time with God. If the devil can bring separation between me and God, if the devil can come in and keep us so busy that we do not spend that one-on-one -on -one time with God. And I'm not talking about praying for the missionaries in Africa, in praying for the people to sustain flooding in, in Kentucky recently, or for people in California having heat waves. I'm not talking about that kind of prayer. I'm talking about the prayer where we really plead with God about our own lives, saying, Lord, you know my heart, you know my struggle, Lord, you know I'm having an issue with this, to really be one-on-one -on -one with God. Jesus referred to this in the model prayer in Matthew chapter 6, and you can find it there. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, Jesus says, but you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, why must we shut the door? Because it's my private time with God. It's my one-on-one -on -one with Him. And why is that important? Because there are some things that I need to confess to God that I don't want anyone else to know about. There are some things that we are too embarrassed to mention even to God. But God knows more than our heart. God knows everything. So the very point where God wants us to come and be authentic and be sincere and really invite him to take my heart and cleanse it and to really use me to his glory, that's where the devil is standing to keep that door shut. Because the devil doesn't want you to go into that inner room and shut it and talk to God one-on-one. -on -one. And as soon as my personal private prayer time starts slipping my spiritual life starts drifting. This leads to the second aspect, because when I don't pray enough, when I don't have that one-on-one -on -one with God, when I do not expose my heart and my life to hear God's voice, why would I seek His will? And then personal Bible study begins to decline. It's not that we don't read the Bible. Oh no, but... As, as great a blessing as the social media is and YouTube with all the sermons, all the online things, the problem is we allow these things to think for us. COVID has done something to our world that has made people realize that they can just go to one sermon to the next to the next and they can watch a variety of sermons on the internet. And that's wonderful because we enjoy all the messages but unfortunately, that message often takes the time of my personal time with God where I can study my word. And when I study the word, it's not just to study about the genealogies in a book of numbers or the counting of the people. No. The study of the word is focused on the area in my life where I have a confrontation with sin. It should focus on the area in my life where my walk with God is under threat. That's where the Bible study makes sense. That's where you just say, Lord, it starts with my personal prayer. I start praying, and this is a cue. Start your prayer and say, Lord, I want you to show me how you want me to live. Lord, I'm struggling with this in my life. Lord, I feel helpless. Lord, I feel if you don't help me, I can move forward. And God will direct you to his word. The Holy Spirit will bring you to the word. And the word will feed you and give you the strength to live with that experience. That's where the personal Bible study comes in. We need to study the Bible. 
You know, it's interesting that Paul was writing to a young man that was his right-hand disciple, so to speak. Timothy was a young man. He was really a joy to the heart of this old missionary to the Gentiles. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14 to 15, Paul writes and he says, Timothy, you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. Notice what Paul says. He says, don't let your parents give it to you. Don't trust your preacher to give it to you. Don't trust the online media and the Dwight Nelsons and the Doug Bachelors out there with all their wonderful sermons. Don't let that become your source of truth. There's nothing that can take the place of your private, personal time with God in His Word. Prayer is your one-on-one -on -one time with God. Studying the Word is God's one-on-one -on -one time with you. The third aspect. Because as soon as we stop studying the Bible, the devil can plant ideas and concepts in minds that are not in accordance with God's Word. And there's one problem area, and I know I'm speaking to my church family, and I love, I grew up Seventh-day Adventist, and I'm speaking to myself too. You know, the problem we as Seventh-day Adventists have is we often read the Bible not so much to enrich my spiritual journey, but I read the Bible to find how I can go and put other people down. I read the Bible to win the arguments. And when I read the Bible so that I can tell my friend at school at a college, you are wrong and I'm right. No. When we study the Bible, it should be for my own spiritual journey first. I need to grow. Here's why. I can win all the arguments and still lose out on eternity. Didn't Jesus say in Matthew 7, many will come to me that day and say, Lord, Lord. Have we not done this in your name? Cast out demons, prophesied. We did these great things. And Jesus will look at them and say, you know what? The problem is, I don't recall that we've ever had a connection. I never knew you. Because it's in studying the word that God and I can become close. Now, when my personal prayer life begins to slip, and my Bible study begins to wane. The next area that is impacted is my lifestyle standards. Because if I do not maintain this, remember what Paul told Timothy, Timothy, from a very young age, that you study the word and you can be assured of these things. The one thing that can happen is lifestyle standards begin to slip. You know, it's interesting that in the first letter that John had to write to the churches, in the book of Revelation, God instructed him, the Holy Spirit instructed him, said, John, write, write to the church in Ephesus. And in Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 to 4, John wrote this to the church in Ephesus. Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 to 4. God says, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. Sounds like us, right? Oh, Lord, I don't, I don't do what the, what the world is doing. I, I'm not like them. The dangers can be like a Pharisaic approach as well. The Pharisees were like that. Remember the, the two men who prayed? The Pharisee and the publican? The Pharisee looked and said, Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like that publican. So Jesus says, I know your works. I know your labor. I know your patience. And that you cannot bear or stand those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my namesake and in order to become weary. That sounds like a, wonder good, a wonderful, excellent testimony, right? But, verse 4, nevertheless, I have this against you, God says, you have left 
your first love. We can be so religious, but that doesn't mean we are spiritual. And this is where we hear it often from our young people saying, you know, that's fake. <laughs> we look right through that, that's fake, because you profess to be something you are not. God wants us to go deep with him. Because when my Bible study, my personal one-on-one with God, no longer helps to address the struggles in my life, and my lifestyle is beginning to be impacted, then along with that becomes a decline in some of the things I view as important. And then the next thing is, you know one. When that begins to happen, when my prayer time is no longer where it should be, my study time is longer there, my lifestyle standards are beginning to become very similar to the world, you know what happens then? Church becomes very uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable when I sit in church and I hear sermons how dare the pastor say that? Because I don't believe that's true anymore. And we begin to criticize the doctrines. We begin to question the church. We just feel uncomfortable in the church. And we forget. God oftentimes will allow us to feel uncomfortable because it's an opportunity for growth. Jesus had the experience where after he was baptized, spent 40 days in the desert, he came to the church, his home church in Nazareth. Luke chapter 4. And as he came, they handed him the scroll of the book Isaiah, and he preached a wonderful sermon that day. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 21, Jesus began to say to him, Today, beloved, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And explain to them, the truth about what Isaiah's prophecy was all about. Now the people were at first welcoming Jesus. He's the hometown boy. He's just come back. And he preaches a wonderful sermon until he makes the applications, but I'm speaking to you. Now look at the change in comfort level. They start to feel very uncomfortable with the message. So that in Luke chapter 4 verse 28 it says... So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. And rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. This is church people. Wanting to kill Jesus. Why? Because the message created discomfort. When the message creates discomfort in your heart and mine. Ask God, Lord, what is it that you want to teach me about this? And I'm sharing this with young people because the devil wants to get you. And the moment this becomes uncomfortable, we begin to question the doctrines, we begin to question the Bible, and we wonder, why is the Bible the way it is? And guess what is the next step? The next step is a step described in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 3. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3. Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. Notice. Why will people not endure the sound teaching of the word of God? Because it creates discomfort. I don't feel comfortable what I'm reading or what I'm hearing. I don't feel comfortable what the church is telling me to do. I don't feel comfortable with the pastor's sermons anymore. I don't feel comfortable with what's happening in the church. And we forget the church is the foundational pillar of truth. So God comes and says through Paul, the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine, but notice they will not become irreligious. They will not step away from religion. Oh, no, no. Instead, they will, according to their own desires, 
have itching ears and they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned into fables. So there will still be people practicing a form of religion. But it's a religion that ties in with secular society at the New Age movement. Now, why do I share this with you? Because young people and the rest of us, this is the real world you and I are living in today. And God has people, you and me, at this point in the world's history for a reason in the world. It's not to go with the flow. It's not to go and do what the world is doing. It's not to just turn a blind eye to everything around me and say, oh, that's not so bad. You are going to be confronted in your college life, in your university life, in your school career where you are, because these are the issues that the world is going to throw at you. And the question is, how are you going to respond? How should I respond? Well, the beauty of it is, God still has a plan. Because we can, we can take hold of that which God has given us already in Jesus Christ. Because the world is not in need of more doctrine. The world is not in need of a new theology. The world is not in need of more churches, but the world is desperately in need to see Jesus lived in a real way through the lives of his people. Amen. And this is where we come in. You know, we often think, what can I do to be a witness for Jesus? Whether you like it or not, you are a witness already. It's not you have to be one, you are one. In your conversation with people, in the places you visit, in how you behave towards others, in your prayer life, in your conversation, people will know. It's interesting, the book of Acts says, when they saw the simplicity of the apostles, they recognized that these people had been with Jesus. When you spend time with Jesus, you won't have to say a word. Your life will show it. And I remember the one lesson that we need to learn is that people always react better to what they see compared to what they hear. We are all creatures that enjoy the visible. We like to see things. The world is desperately looking for people who live their faith. So they can understand, wait a minute, the Bible still makes sense. God is real because I see him in the life of my friend. That's why Paul encouraged Timothy, Timothy, and it's a message that comes to you as well, young people. Paul comes and says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12, Timothy, let no one despise your youth. Amen. What does that mean? Caleb, it means, Tabitha, it means, let no one look down on you and think you're of lower value, right? right. Don't let anyone despise your youth. It means that God uses youth to his glory. You know the average age of the disciples were? Maybe 17, 18, in the early 20s. They were young people with a vigor of life. They were adventurous. And when Jesus says, come follow me, they went. And remember what he said. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So let me reverse that. If I am not a fisher of men, could it be that I'm not following Jesus? Let no one despise your youth, but be an example. Notice, Paul doesn't say, Timothy, you need to go and stand up there and you need to defeat all the arguments. No, Paul says be an example. In what? Be an example, first of all, to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity. Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Paul says these are important. 
Let the world see that God is real and active in your walk with him. How do we do that? When I spend time in my personal one-on-one with God in my prayer room. When I study the word and I know that God's word intersects with those struggles in my life and God's word offers hope. When I, even though at times feel uncomfortable when I hear a message, I don't try and change the message, but I say, Lord, you please change me. And when I can go and share with the world that God still loves and cares about them. Remember the story of Max Lucado, the newborn baby? God not only loves us that way, God loves every person in the world like that. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. But here's the point. The world, as desperate as it is, as chaotic as it is, needs to see Jesus. Amen. Ellen White made a statement. She said, the very last manifestation that will happen before the Lord comes is a manifestation of the character of Jesus in his people. Amen. There's something about it. You know, Paul, in his own experience, after persecuting the church for many years, and then he was stopped in his tracks, he writes in the book of Philippians, chapter 3 and verse 13. And this is what he says. Um, Philippians, chapter 3 and verse 13. After sharing his whole life story. He says, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind me. Which means, don't let your past haunt you. <laughs> If you have, to use the expression, a skeleton in a closet, take that skeleton and go and bury it in a backyard. Get rid of the skeletons in the closet because the devil likes to use the old skeletons to come and haunt you. Paul says, I forget the things that are behind and I reach forward to those things that are ahead and I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. You know what Paul says? He says, Lord, I want to take your invitation seriously. I want to give you my heart. I want you to own me. Because I trust you. So, when Paul writes to Timothy, and he says, Timothy, let no one despise your youth. Notice the context. Because he begins that chapter in verse 1 where he shares about that the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Paul says that's the society that you're going to find yourself in. But when you find yourself in that society, here is what God is calling you to do. Don't let anyone despise your youth. But be an example. Amen. Young people. I pray that God will use you. To great effect. Because you are the leaders that God is looking at today. Not tomorrow. Today. With your youth. Your vigor. Your willingness to take the responsibility. And to be part of the adventure. To finish the work for Jesus so that he can come. It's not all the knowledge we have, no. You know, the interesting thing is, the, the book of Mark chapter 3, I believe it's verse, uh, Mark chapter 3, verse 14, where he talks about when Jesus called the first disciples. You know what he did? Look at what he did. Mark chapter 3, verse 14 says, Then Jesus appointed twelve, and notice what it says, that they might be with him. And that he might send them out to preach. That What came first? The preaching or the spending time with him? To be with him. We cannot present a message to the world 
that we don't embrace ourselves. We cannot present Jesus to the world if Jesus is not in my life. And that's why I pray that God will use you to his glory. And here is a test. Here is a test. Because expression deepens impression. When you live your life to God's glory, it will reveal what is inside of you. The Bible calls it the tree that bears fruit. The inner life finds expression in how we live it. Faith in action. Don't let the devil intimidate you. Don't let that sin that's lying at the door get you. Step over it. Open that door. Take God's hand and step out in faith. Because remember, not only does sin lie at the door, but there's opportunity at the door where God can take you and God can use you. I'm going to invite Sandy to come up because there's something special we want to do for our youth today. And we are so privileged to have so many young people here. Let me say this. Uh, I, 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 I'm sure that I can be the one pastor that really thank the Lord for my young people that make me immensely proud of them. Amen. They love Jesus. Amen. They work together. Are they perfect? No. Am I perfect? No. But we're all sinners. We're on the journey. Heaven is our goal. And the earth is our mission field. Sand is going to share with you what you can really do also to enhance your witness where you are in the areas where you walk, where you study, where you learn, and where you live your life. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for that powerful message, timely and so encouraging and inspiring. Um, I personally, I think I can speak for all of us. Um, I think we're all very thankful for our pastor, and we don't want him to go anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> I think, uh, amen. <laughs> um, first, I want to give a very special thanks to Donna and Claude Steen. Um, their missionary spirit and their love and ministry to the youth has been incredible. And I'm going to cry, and I don't know why. <laughs> I'm just so emotional. <laughs> um, Donna and Claude are very special to me and to my husband. Um, uh, they were key in us moving here. They didn't know us, but they began to pray for us. And we didn't know them, and we didn't know we were coming to North Carolina. And how the Lord led in the youth program here in Hillsboro was all God in an incredible way. Um, in Alaska, I began to develop a burning desire to teach the teens once again. And um, I had been in the Amazon for several years with my husband. We had 18 teens that we gave Bible studies to uh, about three or four times a week. And um, troubled teens, nonetheless, we really had some trials, some challenging times. Um, and then we went to Alaska, and I left them all behind. And that was a really hard thing. And in Alaska, there were no teens. My children were the only ones at church. And so, at the Adventist church there. And so, um, we were there for seven years, and suddenly I started having this burning desire to teach the teens again. And I thought, Lord, how are you going to do this? And it began, I, I started to pray about it, and the more I prayed, the more that desire began to, to really develop again. And, um, and then... Uh, an academy in Tennessee, the Adventist Academy, maybe some of you are aware of it. I know Donna Steen actually went to school there, Highland Academy, called Isaac and I in Alaska, the chaplain, um, one of the elders, and also the Bible teacher at Highland Academy at that time for the freshmen, sophomore, and seniors, called us and asked Isaac and I if we would be the main speakers for the week of prayer that they were having in the fall. And um, we saw... I, I saw that God was answering that burning desire that was starting to develop. And when we went to Highland Academy and spent that time there, it just 
it made me remember the times in the past where I, and it just, it just, I wanted it more. And, um, and then, uh, of course, you know, the other story is when we moved here. And, um, and God, uh, Donna and Claude were instrumental in that as well. Um, we'd been here two weeks, and Donna texted me one day, and she said, would you consider taking over the teen Sabbath school? And uh, a year before that, God had already pre started preparing my heart for it, and I knew what the answer was. Amen? Um, we're told that the youth are primarily, in large degree, the ones that are going to finish the work in these last days. And we know that in the early Advent movement, we've gone through some history, and we know that in the early Advent movement, um, there was the phenomenon in Europe. The early Advent movement began in Europe first, you know. It just took more prominence in the U.S., and so we tend to think of it here more. But it began in Europe first, and uh, the phenomenon, a child preachers. And if anyone has studied Advent history, they will know that that was an amazing time. Um, they, God decided to use the children because they weren't at the age that they could be put in prison. And uh, the adults were being put in jail for preaching the truth, and so God started to use the children. And we know here in the U.S., Ellen White was how old? 17. Imagine, I think a lot of our youth are almost 17, right? Incredible. So I believe that God is moving once again in these days. And uh, when I shared the story to Elderstein and Donna about how many of our youth were accepted, just in passing one day I shared to them what had happened and how I wasn't homeschooling my kids anymore and they were going to go to Eno Academy and they're like, what's going on? <laughs> And so I shared with them, well, I'll tell you what's going on. <laughs> and when they found out that a large number of our youth here in Hillsboro had been accepted into the academy, they were floored. And um, soon they came up with the idea of putting together a special service to dedicating all our youth um, here in, in Hillsboro Church. Um, since we have so many of them, but dedicating them in a very special way to the work that is going forward at this time. And as Adventists, we see the signs of the times. They tell us that Jesus is coming very soon. And we know that time is short, and we know the Great Commission. Let's just turn very quickly to Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. And um, Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20. And, um, you know, if I could have uh, one of our youth, actually, if would you mind just uh, uh, reading that out loud for me? I, I forgot my Bible. Matthew 28, 60. Oh, thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll read it. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> it says, uh, Matthew 28, 16 through 20. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen? So youth, Abigail, Caleb, Caleb Andrew, Tabitha, Alyssa, Tay, Lily, Jesse, Jonathan, um, Stephen, Sydney, Camille, boy, I, Summer, Summer is still a part of our group, um, God has a very special work for you. Amen. And the number one thing, as the pastor said, is to keep your faith alive. And that's by 
a personal connection with the Lord. Maybe you won't be talking about your faith every day at school or wherever you are, but just having that personal connection with God makes us a light wherever we are. Amen. Amen. This will be the most important thing that you guys can do, having that personal connection with God. I want to just share very quickly a short story of my own personal experience. Um, I was raised in public school in Alaska. Um, We left South America. My dad's Dutch. My mother's Colombian. Uh, We left South America when I was six months old to go and live in an Eskimo village in the interior of Alaska. And when I was three, we moved to another town, a port town, uh, very little Adventist Adventist um, influence there. I went to a public school uh, at the age of five without knowing English. I only knew Spanish. Um, it was a very hard time. Um, I won't go into it, but from kindergarten up until I graduated uh, for my senior year in high school, I graduated with all my friends from kindergarten. But all 30 of them, <laughs> very small compared to uh, what I see at where uh, our kids are going. But um, not many move away from Alaska, and newcomers, not many stay. So, um, but I know that, I know the pressure um, as a youth in a public school. I was the only Seventh day Adventist, my brother and I. And, uh, since it was small, my, my, high school, my high school alone was about 150, okay? So everyone knows you. Everyone knows what you eat. Everyone knows uh, your parents. Uh, everyone knows that you don't participate in functions from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Um, everyone very quickly knows who you are, what you do, uh, everything. (laughs) And I often begged my parents to send me to a boarding school where I wouldn't be different. And so one year they did. My ninth grade year in high school, I'd been, you know, from kindergarten in my ninth grade year, they decided they sent me to Hawaiian Mission Academy on Oahu. And uh, anyways, I'll tell you or the youth sometime about that later, but um, that that was the first and only year they... (laughs) took me back home. And um, I'm thankful, though, for the decisions, for that decision that my parents made. Um, It made me a stronger person to be surrounded by everybody that did not believe like me. And it made me more prayerful. And it made me start very young in life to journal. I started journaling in elementary school when I was about seven or eight years old, profusely. And it made me Uh, a prayerful person. I started going with everything to the Lord. Um, But I want to share one incident with you guys that happened around the time that I was 16 years old. Um, I was a junior in high school around that time, and there was a little girl. She was in middle school. She was about in seventh grade. She was 12 years old. Um, I knew who she was because you know everybody, right? (laughs) But I didn't know her. Um, I I had seen her many times. Um, she, uh, the middle school would actually come through the cafeteria to eat their lunch before the high schoolers did, and when they cleared out, then the high schoolers would have their lunch. And so um, I had seen her on occasion. I was extremely extrovert. <laughs> and um, so um, whenever I saw someone that was quiet or timid, you know, I always say, hi, you know, and I'd comment on their hair, their clothes, and... Um, And so, um, you know, I had done that several times to her, and uh, she had beautiful hair. And uh, I actually had actually once at a function, at a big function or something was happening, and some little girls came to me and asked me to do their hair. And so I did, and she was one of them. Um, So she was quiet and timid, but um, every time she did see me, I realized that she would get really happy when she saw me, and she would wave. Well, um... Now, everyone knew her particularly because her brothers, her two older brothers, it was just her and her two older brothers, were very popular. They were very good looking. 
they were very good students and they were really good at sports. And so she, um, she had these two very older brothers. She was in elementary, she was like 12 and they were like um, 17 and 18. So, and they were very popular. And so everyone knew her. Um, but one day she approached me and she asked me if she could go to church with me. Now, that is very unusual. I was about 16, she was 12. I didn't know her um, very, you know, very well. I was shocked. I'd never, I, I just, <laughs> I didn't even know what to say. Growing up in the 70s and 80s in Alaska, it was totally different. I don't know how, you know, here we're in the Bible Belt, but um, there every, everybody was agnostic or atheist. And there was very few. There was uh, two Mormon girls and maybe four Jehovah's Witness. Um, but most in my school were agnostic or atheist. And so this was very strange. She didn't really come from any kind of background. Anyway, she asked me if she could go to church with me. And she knew I went to church on Saturday. Um, I told her, well, because she was 12, I, I said, you're, you're going to have to ask your parents. Um, if you can come to church with me. Um, well, to make a long story short, on Sabbath morning, we got to church, and that little girl was dressed up, and she was outside the church door, and no one was there, and she was waiting for the doors to open. And um, now my brother and I were the only kids in church and this is typical in Alaska. At that time, anyways, we were the only kids in church. Um, everyone else was elderly. We did have potluck every Sabbath, so that was definitely a highlight for a young person. <laughs> and um, everyone fell in love with her. Um, and I'm going to tell you guys something. She never stopped coming. Amen. She soon became a vegetarian, only a few months later. And not just vegetarian. She went full on. She became 100% vegan. And not one person was 100% vegan except our family in that church. And um, she got baptized about a year or two later. And an elderly couple in the church paid her way through Adventist school. She graduated from Walla Walla. Now, this is a really drastic situation. Um, it was all God. It wasn't me. But I was a light that she saw in her life. Amen. And I'm not perfect. <laughs> you guys know me. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was, um, if you knew her life, you would understand more that I was a light in her life. But from the outside of her life, you would have never known it. Her two older brothers were very popular, very good looking with high GPAs, and they were very good at sports. And uh, I say that because the, the, the schools in Alaska are very sports oriented. Um, but don't think it was easy street for her. Her entire family, almost her entire family, except for her two brothers, were completely against her and the choices she was making at that time, but that girl did not budge. It was incredible to watch. She um, became a vegetarian. She started keeping Sabbath. She forfeited much of the sports because in Alaska, they're always on Friday and Saturday. This is a child who was not raised with the truth at all had never even been, been, come in contact with an Adventist in her life. And, um, but she kept going. It was, and I'm going to tell you guys, I, I didn't do much. <laughs> I complimented her. I smiled at her. I always noticed her when she was around. And that was powerful to her. I never imagined what it would do. But one thing is, is that I always wanted people to know that I cared and that I love them. And not because I wanted to convert them. It was definitely a part of my personality, but to convert them was the last thing on my mind. 
So um, I just wanted to share that story. I wasn't going to share it. And early this morning, um, when Donna said she couldn't make it, I prayed. And God brought that story to my mind. <laughs> I had forgotten about it. Now it's this powerful story, right? I hadn't thought about it in years. And um, anyways, she's, she's always been special to me. Um, so I want uh, Claude, if he could come up and just, we're going to, um, we're going to um, hand out um, some special journals that Donna and I went and picked out for the youth um, this week. And yeah, you know, maybe I'll share a little bit just afterwards. But if um, Claude, if you just probably just uh, call out their names, and then one by one, when he calls out your name, um, just come up, and I will hand you a bag. And then if you guys can just stay up here, so that afterwards we can have special prayer over you. All right. We are so blessed to have these teenagers Amen. in our congregation. Amen. God chose you long before you were born. Amen. He knew you, and he has a purpose for you. And so I, as I call your name, I'd like for you to come on up. We have a gift for you, and we, are, we will have a special prayer for you. So just come on up and stay here for just a little bit. And I'm... These are not in any particular order, except I'm going to do girls first, and then we'll have the guys. So uh, just come up as I call your name. Would you do that? Alyssa Nemoroski. <laughs> Abigail Workman. Sydney Musgrave. Camille Musgrave. Tay Rem, Lily Parr. I will do. Um, is Lily here today? This is for Lily, and this one's for you. Okay. Jessie Blue, I think she is not here today. Okay, I'll say her. All right. Tabitha Andrew. And I believe that Lily Cooley is not here today. I have her. Okay. Then we do have some guys. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Caleb Workman. St uh, Stephen Popescu. We've got a couple of Popescus, and I think they're going to be here in a few moments. And then Caleb Andrew. All right. Um, I saw Lynn Popescu when I started speaking about the, them. She went out to get them, I think. So they'll be coming in in just a second. The thing that has impressed me so much is where Jesus said to his disciples, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. Do you know what the rest of that verse says? If you love one another. Come on in, guys. Um, yep, yeah, Jonathan and Stephen Popescu. We have a gift for each of you. All right, great. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Amen. And you know, there are... There are people all around us that are wanting to know God better, that feel an emptiness in their heart and want to, to see God. And they can see God in you, young people. Mm -hmm. When you are in relationship with Jesus Christ, when you realize that God has called you to ministry, and when you love one another and love the people around you, Wonderful things can happen, just like the story that Sandy told you about her experience. We would like to pray for you and ask for God to set you apart in a very special way. 
to his service. I wish I was facing you instead of... Uh... Okay. Um, Sandy is suggesting that, Pastor, would you come up and place hands on them and also el the elders that are here will do that and then we will pray for, for all of you. And I'll tell you what, you students also can place your hand on the shoulder or the head of somebody that's near you and uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pray for you that God's blessing will be on you, okay? Let's, let's bow our heads together as we pray. Wonderful Father in heaven, we are so grateful for these young people that you have brought to this little congregation. Amen. Young people with a desire to serve you, with a great love in their hearts for you and also for others that don't know you. Mm -hmm. And Father, you have given them a mission field. And I just pray earnestly that whether it's in their neighborhood or whether it's in their school, wherever they are, that they will be watching for others that need your love and be willing to share that love and that truth with them. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we think that we're the only one in the school that loves you. One of your prophets thought that too. His name was Elijah, and he got really discouraged, and he said, God, I'm the only one that has, is still serving you. And God said back to his prophet, Elijah, you don't know, but there are 7,000 people in Israel that have never bowed the knee to Baal that are praying to me every day. And Father, I pray that whether it's in school or on the playground or wherever it may be, that these young people will be able to see those that are searching, whose, uh, whose love is in your, whose love for you is in their heart in, as, in just a small way, but that needs to grow and can grow through friendship and love. Thank you for these young people. We set them apart now for a special ministry of youth to youth, Bless them, Father, in their ministry, and as they take these books, these journals that have been given to them, Father, help them to write down every time they see God, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whether it's in a scripture, whether it's in another student that may not even be a Christian, and yet God is in that soul, in that person. And when they see God working to change lives, their own or others, mm -hmm. Father, I pray that you will help these young people to write these things down when they see God so that they will never forget how God has used them in mighty ways to change this world and to get it ready for his soon coming. Amen. These things we pray in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 At this time, we will conclude our worship service here with a special item. Whitney? And... Uh,